Good morning, everybody. So my name is Marcus Coleman, and I work for ERA Energy. I've worked for ERA for about 10 years. Uh, in my career with ERA, uh, I have operated uh, steam injection, heavy oil, light oil, water injection, cyclic steam, heavy oil facilities, and light oil facilities. Managed those groups. I moved into production engineering about five years after I started. And this last year, I moved into IT as an information analyst and then quickly was shifted into this role called a business relationship manager. And if you don't know what that is, you're in the same boat as my wife. And what I told her is I'm a collaborative problem solver. So uh, this work was done in 2017. I will describe the impacts that we did see in 2017, and I will talk about what ERA did in 2018. I cannot release the, the financial impact for 2018. I can't get that pushed through or CFO in time. However, if you do have questions after, please pull me aside and I'd be happy to talk with you about it. So today we're gonna to talk about enhancing surveillance and culture. And we're gonna be talking about the water flood operation and engineering surveillance stream in our Bellridge asset. So real quick about ERA, we're an oil and gas producer. We're California based and operated. We have nearly 1,100 employees. We produce approximately 25% of all California's oil and gas. And our motto is, ERA Energy powers great todays and better tomorrows. And we are owned by Exxon and Shell as a joint venture. The Bellridge Complex, so I'm gonna take you from ERA, now down to Bellridge. Bellridge is one of the largest oil fields in the nation and is one of the most dense oil fields in the nation. The Bell Ridge Producing Complex covers an area, the, the main part of Bell Ridge is what I'm gonna describe, covers an area roughly 22 miles long by 2.5 miles wide, and you'll get a nice visual of that here in a second. We produce nearly 80,000 barrels a day of oil equivalent, and in Bell Ridge, Maine, we operate approximately 7,500 production wells and 5,000 injection completions. It is a tremendous amount to pack into one area. This is what part of our field looks like. It's very flat. And as you can see, you, could, you, you might have a hard time driving a pickup through some of those spots. And this is not one of the most dense parts of our field. So the complex nature of Bell Ridge is the sheer density of the equipment. So I'm gonna take you now from Bell Ridge. And in Bell Ridge, we have a light oil and heavy oil value stream. We're gonna focus on the light oil water flood value stream. So we inject water in the ground to produce oil out from that rock. And in the light oil water flood in Bell Ridge, this is kind of how Bell Ridge is shaped. This is a plot from one of our arc maps. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the production completions. We have about 3,800 of those. And then 2,200 injection completions. So I had to separate them out because if I lay them on top of each other, you just see black, right? So. Uh, it is very, very dense, and, and that's very key to what we're going to talk about today. That's a 10-mile stretch of what we're looking at, or 16 kilometers. So operation surveillance specifically for the water flow wells. So we're not going to talk about the production wells for this example, specifically water flood. 10 miles long, 2,200 completions. In your mind, for the next two seconds, think, how many operators would I staff for that much pipe crews, surface equipment, engineering responses, 2,200 completions, 10 miles, dense. We use five, five people. Their day starts at 6.30 in the morning. They have to do, run their KPIs and metrics, understand the health of their system, get out to the field, touch the crews, make sure they're safe. That's our number one priority. Uh, and then they can start their day by going and checking out each one of their completions. So 500 injection completions per operator. So how do we do it? This is our story with Pi. Uh, on the y-axis, you have process maturity. On the x-axis, we move from reactive to proactive. So if you want to think about where we originally started, you know, and, and some of you guys, if you were operations folks or worked out in the field, you know, maybe before I was born, it was very manual. So you showed up and you're a pumper and you had a gauge and you wrote down your clipboard and you went back and you give it to the engineer and the engineer would do some analysis and tell you you need to go back out and fix something. Great. So 
we moved into this exception-based surveillance environment, and that's really where I came into ERA about 10 years ago. So the equipment, we, we set parameters for the equipment to tell us, hey, I have a plugged control valve, or you know, uh, if I, we have a disposal equipment, you know, we're dropping flow off and pressure's increasing, probably have a subsurface issue. You know, the equipment's telling us what's going on. And now, using uh, OSI soft pie and the analytics that we're gonna, for the first use case, we moved into near real-time analytics. And I'm gonna use the, the, the term near real-time. I hear a lot of real-time data and real-time analytics. There's some latency in it, and uh, that's not on the developer side, that's on the telecom side for us. So the water injection equipment, for example, only communicates every 15 minutes. So you're as good as every 15 minutes per, and they don't all cycle at once, so you get this kind of sporadic information coming in. So what do you do with that? How is that, how is that valuable? Well, part of the reason why near real-time analytics is valuable is that the, the, the density of data that you get it's the, the high resolution packed in data that you can see uh, throughout the day. So as an example, we, we use pressures and averages for the day. So we could look at an injection well and go, man, the pressure's pretty stable and flow rate looks pretty good. Well, pressure is an average for us, or it was. So this is kind of, I, I liken this to, I don't have kids, but I was one at one point. Uh, and my parents would ask me, hey, how was school today? And I would say, okay. <laughs> that's not the whole story, <laughs> right? And all kinds of stuff happened at school that day, but what they got was, okay, when you have averages, you get, okay. When we looked at the, the pie data that we were bringing in, we saw violent changes up and down, 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 within the control parameters, so I use that term, maybe it's a little strong, but up to its control limit, down, up to its control limit, down. But it would average really nicely. What should we do with that? We didn't know yet. So where we started with was, well, we have metering issues. You know, we can put a man on the moon, but we can't measure water accurately in Bell Ridge. <laughs> let's, let's go after the metering issues. So we create some flow metering dashboards. That helped out significantly. PID loop tuning analysis, right? If you have a valve swinging open and shut all the time, maybe you need to slow that thing down. Less reactive. Give it some time to balance out. Failed surface control alerts. Hey, you have a failed piece of equipment over here. So now we took our exception based from date, the averages and cumulative volumes to this high resolution data tool. Measurement analytic tool suite. Again, this is comparing uh, what the plant says it's putting out to the 2,000 injectors in the field and reconciling if you have a discrepancy, where is that discrepancy? What we're gonna talk about today for the operations example is the pipeline health dashboard. So in Bell Ridge, it's very, very, very important to inject water into diatomite rock. So when we talk about light oil, that's producing out of a diatomite reservoir. And it's very porous. And so if you pull oil out and you don't put water in, the rock can subside and you lose well bores or you know, can affect facilities, can damage the matrix. So if we stop putting water in, we turn the oil off until we can get the water back in, okay? Pipeline, what do pipelines have to do with that? Well, pipelines deliver volume and pressure. And if I lose inside diameter because of scale buildup or something, uh, I'm gonna lose both those things. So something that we do to fix that is we pig. And if you don't know what a pig is, it looks like a foam bullet. It's a slightly oversized for the ID of the pipe and you stuff it in there and you turn the water on and it sends it down the line. I don't know why they call it a pig. The best example I've been, or reason I've been given is uh, it squeals as it runs down the pipe. So <laughs> squeals all the way home. So we, we create this pipeline dashboard. And what we're gonna talk about are, is one of our main pipelines that we piloted this on. So of all of these water injectors, 500 injection completions per operator, we're gonna look at one operator's area. Right, so he's currently, he's doing two operators worth of work. It's a five mile stretch. So this is, this is what the pipeline in ArcGIS actually looks like, give you an idea. And then we modeled this piece of pipe very simply. So 
down in, in this area, this is representing the discharge from our pumps. So 122,000 barrel a day flow rate at 825 PSI out the discharge of the pump. Then we have a, a launcher, launcher data. So you lose, you go from 825 to 809 at the pig launcher facility, okay? And the flow rate changes. Interesting, why is that? I can explain that in a minute. At the receiver, so you have point A, which is the launcher. At the receiver, you have point B. Okay, so we're taking some more pressure there. You know, so what? That becomes the first question. So what? How is this impactful? What does this do? If you look under North Bellridge there, you'll see 95 Delta P clean pipe. Well, we challenge our engineers to engineer. Go out and model the pipe. Give us a pressure decline curve that tells us where our X value is our flow rate at point A at the launcher. It should spit out a Y value of clean uh, delta P clean pipe of 95 PSI. So at 105 barrels a day, you should anticipate losing 95 PSI through that pipe. And that's, that's dynamic, right? As the flow rate changes, so will that delta P. Then we looked at, well, what's the current? Well, it's 100, so it, we have a 5% deviation. That's okay. Okay, so what happens if it gets to 20%? We, we pulled some arbitrary numbers based on operators' tacit knowledge, some facility engineering tacit knowledge, and uh, we were able to keep a substantial amount of water injection online. This process takes all five guys, and it takes the better part of a day. So we talked about the start of their day, and they have to, now they realize, oh, I need to go pig this line. That takes up half their day. And oh, by the way, before this, how did we get this data? When I started on this team, we had to go out and screw manual gauges on and profile the pipeline. We didn't have sensors along the pipeline. We didn't have a need for it because we didn't have an analytic tool to help us decide what we would do with it. So within the first 10 seconds of walking in for the day, I can tell you exactly what the health of this pipeline is. And by that afternoon, we we pigged the pipeline and cleaned it, and we've kept the water back on. We've gotten to a proactive state with that. We start to understand that, hey, at eight, nine percent, you probably need to pig it in the next two days or so. So after we piloted this, what do you think we did? Well, we modeled it for the whole north half of our field for the larger pipelines. So that's where that other, when I said, why did we lose flow rate between point A and the discharge pumps? It's because there's another line that comes off of there as well. So, so we have pig launchers and receivers all over the field. What did this do? Well, this said, we need more pig launchers and receivers, right? So data forced the business to say, hey, you had a business need, we showed you the value, and now, it's playing some catch ball, what are you gonna do about that? Oh, we're gonna scale up we see the value. So in this, I always break down ROI into, into three things. I'm a real simple guy, and it's very basic, time, money, and morale. So in the time space at the bottom, we saved a significant uh, man hour cost to, to our infrastructure to survey the pipeline, right? So uh, money, this is what everyone cares about, right, money. Uh, millions in annual revenue generation and cost avoidance. Remember, if we lose water, we have to turn the oil off. That's revenue. Uh, and then also the mechanical replacement of the pipe if it becomes too, too built up. So we published in 2017 that this tool and with the other analytic tool that I'm gonna show, uh, we shot for two million between the two tools in an ROI value and we hit 14 million in the first year, and that, that was not the entire year. And I can tell you with confidence that uh, that was the tip of the iceberg as we start to develop more of these tools. So this, this for ERA was, uh, we had to start in operations. We didn't get a whole lot of buy-in from engineering initially. Engineering, uh, you know, we reconcile things in engineering uh, weeks, months at a time, big data sets. What are we gonna do with real-time analytics? What does that do for us, right? Prove it out there first, so we did. And then we moved over to the engineering space in the same value stream. So again, same amount of completions for that value stream, Bell Ridge Complex. How do we apply this to engineering? Well, we created wellbore integrity alerts. So we have completions, we have wellbores that have multiple completions, and if they communicate, 
that's an issue for our regulatory agencies. So I want to know instantly when those pressures start to come together, because they should not, and when they do, tell me that probably have a tubing hole. We need to shut that thing down, pull out the, the pipe, and get it replaced. We also created a well interaction analysis tool. So I think this is where we're going to continue to go in the development in the geophysical space and reservoir engineering, production engineering. Our patterns, are, our production patterns are very tight. They're injector centric. So injector sits in the middle of the pattern and it supports nine producers around it. We're a three to one ratio and if you want more information about that, I can draw it out for you. But the key here is that what happens when that injector does this throughout the day? What do the producers do? Do they make more oil or do they make less oil? Or, you know, how's the pattern? If I shut this producer off over here, what does it do to the, the rock around it? What are the other sensors on the other well bores telling me? There's a lot to, to be done here. And my hypothesis is that the industry is going to start seeing the value of this in the reservoir space and start profiling pressure fall off tests. What is the density of that rock without having to drill it out? Do I, do I ramp these producers down because it creates more pressure on the, the surrounding producers and overall I make more oil? Uh, steam injection? Steam is very expensive to make. Why would I put more in the ground than I need to get the same amount of oil out? I think a lot of things can happen here and so I, I'm excited to see what the industry and, and really what ERA does with that as well. Production allocation measurement dashboards. Measurement is an issue everywhere. So also, you know, you have uh, the guys who are the, the pumping unit team, right? And they send, in, they send oil to the DHI, and they said, hey, we sent 100,000 barrels to the DHI, and the DHI says, we only got 90,000. And when I started working for the DHI, they said, hey, man, go in there and find out where they're hiding all that oil. You know, who, who, who's to say whose meter is right? You know, and so when you work in a field that big, you can't take the time to sit and have those conversations all the time. You need the equipment to tell you which one you can trust and which one you can't. And then pressure transient analysis. And that's what we're going to talk about. So for water injectors, this is, a, this is a core site, and we've moved to vision since, but this is a core site graph uh, in Pi that shows the, the red dotted line at the top is is the pressure that we can inject up to, and that's measured on the y-axis, and time is measured on the x. And the white line is the actual pressure of the well. So once we, we hover right around that red line for, for so long, the well shuts itself off. The injector shuts itself down. And it says, hey, operator, come and look at me. Something's wrong. The operator knows, notifies the engineer. The engineer decides, hey, do I do an R&R &R job? You know, do I put some acid down there? Do, do I need to refrack it, add pay? We're going to do that a couple of times. And after that, it goes to the dead letter pile. We're just we're going to have to redrill it. Redrilling is very expensive. And guess what happens when you redrill? You get the same result. So this tool allows you to not redrill and cycle these wells on and off for the same result. So engineering surveillance, dramatically reduced manual surveillance to identify potential injector redrill. Again, millions here. And we're moving towards a proactive culture and staff feels empowered. So overall, again, significant reduction in both operations and engineering surveillance. Millions in annual revenue generation and cost avoidance. The most important thing here, though, that I want everyone to take away, if you take away one thing from this whole presentation, it's this bullet point. Just because you spend the time and money to implement a specific software does not mean that you are going to get a giant ROI, or any ROI for that matter. It is your ability to connect your people, tacit knowledge, and value. What is your business value? And uh, something that resonated with me yesterday that Larry Megan from Praxair said, it's not about being more digital, it's about changing how the work gets done. And that's what we managed to do here, and because of that, we show up different, the questions we ask are different, the actions we take are different. We're moving to a proactive culture, and most importantly, our staff feels empowered by this data. Thank you.